This episode is sponsored by Linode. Do you need a Linux server for your latest creation? Then check them out. They provide SSDs, 40 gigabit per second network connections, and top of the line hardware to run your server on. It deploys Linux in seconds from the Linode cloud and you can choose your Linux distro and node location right from the manager. They have locations in Asia, North America, and Europe and they have a sweet set of tools to make it easy to manage it. If the web interface isn't your thing, they also have an API and a command line. So definitely go check them out. They also provide two-factor authentication, IPv6, DNS manager, cloning, scaling, and everything else that you want. So definitely get the most out of your Linux node and check them out at linode.com. And check them out at devchat.tv slash linode. Hey everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week we're going to be talking to Dylan Shimon. Dylan, do you want to say hi? Hello, how's it going? It's going well. Now you were on episode 62 of JavaScript Jabber, which was about four years ago as we record this, probably four years and a few months by the time it comes out. Yeah, just kind of interesting. Uh, we had you on to talk about the Dojo Toolkit, um, which is also you know technology that you don't really hear much about these days. So yeah, it'll be fun to dig into your story and uh, what you're doing, what you're working on, and all that good stuff. Uh, sure, thanks for having me. I can't believe it's been that long, but yeah, time flies, huh? I know it's funny. I've I've talked to several people who have been on the show, and I'm like, yeah. So you were on what a few months ago, and it's like, no, it was like two years ago. And so yeah, it's just kind of the way it goes. But yeah, let's go ahead and dig into your story, though. Uh, we usually start at the beginning. How did you get into programming? Sure, thanks. Uh, so basically, when I was pretty young, I, I would say even maybe seven or eight years old, my father and I took a basic computer programming class together where we used TRS 80s. And um, then, but I wouldn't say that was really the start so much as uh, in junior high, probably in the mid 1980s, I received my first Commodore 64 computer. And I dabbled in basic and I picked up the programmer's reference guide for the C64 and dabbled in assembly and learned all the joys of trying to write data to a tape drive, which really <laughs> makes me sound dated. <laughs> and then really got upgraded with five and a quarter inch floppy drives, which was pretty amazing. And then, and then in high school, of course, I took some Pascal classes because I didn't want to have to take typing and, and things like that. And really that, that's sort of, you know, the real basics of me learning were just early computers ranging from basic to Pascal to assembly and just trying to make sense of it all and having fun. Awesome. So where did you go from there to wind up uh, doing JavaScript? Did you get a degree or was there some other path you took? Oh, that's pretty funny. So um, basically as an undergraduate, I studied chemistry and mathematics, which, but I did some basic HTML and discovered the web roughly my junior year in college. And then I started graduate school in physical chemistry at UCLA. And I was studying the topology and rheology of quasi two-dimensional foam, which is basically, if you imagine a bunch of beer bubbles at the top of a glass and you spin it around really quickly and you watch how the bubbles rearrange as force is applied to it, um, I was studying that. Uh, and so basically, I wanted to put my experiments on the web. And so I started learning about this new language that had just been invented called JavaScript and realized it was nowhere near possible to do what I wanted to do. Um, but I really got into JavaScript. So I dropped out of graduate school a few years later. And then eight years after that point in time, it was possible to show my experiments with Dojo and SVG, though. By that point, I had left behind the smells of chloroform and was really just enjoying <laughs> <laughs> enjoying the JavaScript work at the time. So Interesting. So, so yeah, so then uh, kind of walk us through a little bit more of the the journey into JavaScript. So you got into JavaScript, you, should we say, dropped out of grad school and decided that this was what you wanted to do. So yeah, how do you, how do you get into, uh, you know, Dojo and, and some of the other technologies that you got into make this yeah. a full-time thing? Sure. So basically right after grad school, I helped start a company called SitePen. And at the time we tried to build a platform for building and modifying web applications and, mm -hmm. you know, think something like Google page creator, but probably 10 years too soon. So that led me to really learn how JavaScript worked and um, started doing some consulting work and things like that. And basically, I, I was started working with Alex Russell, who had a project called NetWindows at the time, which is a predecessor to really any JavaScript framework most people have worked with. 
And so we, we got together and decided to create a next generation version of a DHTML toolkit, which ended up becoming Dojo back in 2004. And, um, you know, what we learned was like the things that we created even back then are things that are now part of the language, you know, whether it's things like asynchronous patterns such as promises or even modules or even widgets, which have kind of led to the web component spec. And so, you know, really we just did a lot of that sort of pioneering work along with others to sort of say, okay, if we treat JavaScript as a real programming language, what can we get out of it? And then, you know, over the years, we've built on that and done various data grids and other utilities for testing and, and optimizing applications and whatnot. And so, you know, really, it was just kind of seeing the promise of this language and wanting to make it what we felt it should become and then watching it take far too long for that to happen. But that, you know, the feeling today is that we're, we're much further along than we've ever been. Very cool. So yeah, so you you helped build up Dojo as a as an attempt to uh, sort of create the the web that you wanted to work in. I'm I'm curious. I mean, what what were some of the ideas there that have have stood the test of time, and what were some of the ideas that sort of didn't pan out for you? Well, I would say that a lot of the things we did in Dojo were, I guess, sort of on the right path, but you know maybe first versions that ended mm -hmm. up iterating quite a bit before they made their way into the language. Other things are sort of timing, right? You know, we were there very early and we, we addressed a lot of the needs of enterprises early on. But, you know, to tell people in 2005 or 2006 that you need to architect a front-end application was kind of met with a lot of dazed looks of, of confusion <laughs> of why you would want to do that, you know? And, and so really, it's kind of just learning that things happen the same over time. If you wait a few years, history repeats itself. Um, you know, sort of seeing that the, the ideas you had weren't necessarily right, but that they helped move the web in the right direction. You know, that that's pretty powerful. And really, we never created Dojo to say like, hey, we want to create the world's leading framework. We said, you know, we created this because we wanted it to be easier to build web applications and and to have JavaScript taken more seriously as a language. Gotcha. Now, JavaScript is sort of, well, not sort of, JavaScript has definitely caught on over the last uh, several years. H how do you feel like that has changed what you do now? Well, I no longer answer the question of, oh, JavaScript, you mean Java? Or, <laughs> um, <laughs> right, yeah. which was the, the thing I would hear for the first seven or eight years, or, uh -huh. or why would you learn that when you could learn a real programming language or, you know, other, <laughs> other funny things? like that, right? And I like to think it only happened the way it has because those of us who picked JavaScript very early on are very stubborn people um, who, you know, really just keep going and going and going and don't give up. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten the rest of your question already. <laughs> well, mostly, you know, we, we have all of these innovations now. The browsers are capable of so much more than they were capable of in 2004. Right. We have... Node.js, which a lot of people have adopted, uh, especially people who were kind of on the front end of things, wanted to, oh, well, now I can do work on the back end with the same language and the same tools. And so I'm wondering just how has your, how has your career, how has your focus, how has what you do now changed from what it was way back when you were working on things like Dojo? I mean, I would say the expectations have changed a lot. And by the way, we still work on Dojo, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, I think the expectations of 2004 were, man, I hope I can make something that might work in a browser or two, to, mm -hmm. you know, the expectation of I'm competing against every platform out there and trying to create the best possible software in the world and, you know, do it in a way that's distributable everywhere in a browser. Um, so really the, and the capabilities have grown, you know, back then we were hoping to one day get native vector graphics support. And now, you know, that's an assumption and, mm -hmm. you know, things like audio and video and, you know, real time capabilities, there were ways to do those things, but they were very brittle and fragile and, and hacky. And now we have sort of real engineering solutions to many of those things, mm -hmm. you know, there's still the next wave of like, okay, well, this sort of works, but, you know, obviously there's going to be a better way to do this that we'll, we'll continue to see that reinvent itself. But, you know, we've really gone from a day where you had a few people that were sort of interested in this and it, maybe it wasn't even their day job to now literally hundreds of thousands of engineers who, if not millions, who 
write code in JavaScript every day, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. So what do you do at SitePen? Uh, it looks like you're still yeah. there. So I know, am. Many yeah, we're later. still a thing. Yeah, so I'm the CEO and co-founder, and I do a number of things. You know, we're a company of about 30 people, and we've been focused on professional services around JavaScript for many years. And part of that was sort of being in the Valley in, you know, the mid-2000s, you know, like 2004, 2005, and seeing that everyone had an idea, but no one had people who knew JavaScript to help make it happen. And so, you know, we really felt that if we could provide just really high quality assistance in, in the form of sort of development assistance, support and training focused on creating really nice JavaScript applications, that that would help more people out. And so I sort of lead the charge on that, you know, help run a company. Um, I do a lot of speaking at conferences, traveling um, for that business development, customer relationship, as well as helping to find the technical direction for our open source projects, which um, we're in a big major rewrite phase for Dojo and Intern. So we're planning to release Dojo 2 and Intern 4 this year. Um, Dojo 2 is basically a from the ground up rewrite of Dojo, asking the question of, okay, if you were to build a, a modern framework for enterprises that you know need to meet the needs of enterprises at scale, what what would you build on? You know, you'd obviously start with ES6 and new stuff. You'd probably want to use TypeScript. Um, you know, how would you build UI components in a way that would support interoperability with other frameworks? How would you leverage reactivity and asynchronous patterns? And you know, so there's going to be a lot of similarity there between things like React and and you know Vue and Angular mm -hmm. and whatnot. But there are also going to be some things that are different, given that most of those frameworks are primarily focused on consumer space. But then, you know, you can do enterprise features with them, but it might not be sort of how they're built from the ground up. So Dojo 2 is currently in its early beta stage. And then um, Intern is our testing framework. It's sort of a glue architecture that combines how to write tests for unit testing, functional testing, performance, accessibility, you know, visual regression, um, looking at code coverage analysis, then hooking into a number of continuous integration tools. And Intern 4 is basically also rewritten in TypeScript to try to make it easier to leverage all the modern language features and actually test those natively rather than just testing them after they're transpiled. Um, so it's a pretty, you know, I mean, I think every project of Note has rewritten itself since ES6 has come out, right? Just mm -hmm. because it, it has to. Yeah. And um, we kind of took our time to do it right because we felt like a lot of the patterns um, that were introduced in ES6, you know, needed some time to, to fully bake. For example, ES modules are still kind of being finalized this year and are just mm -hmm. being introduced into browsers. So we didn't really want to, you know, make the developer ergonomics, you know, become worse before we could, you know, provide a solution that we thought would be better than, than sort of what was there before. So we're a little conservative in that area, but I think we're, we're doing some really nice work. So would you say it's, it's fair to say that SitePen is built around open source? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously we don't make our money in a traditional sense on open source. Right. You know, we don't charge licensing fees or things like that. But we've been working on open source software for 13 years and investing pretty heavily in, you know, Dojo and Intern and um, work on other projects. We have Dgrid, which is a very large data grid component. Um, and, you know, really to us, you know, we made the decision very early on that we could spend a lot of money marketing our services and, and obviously you still needed to spend some time and money marketing or we could spend time creating things that would make our team more productive and release those as open source to help other engineers be more productive and really that's been our primary you know sort of business strategy for how to raise awareness for our business but also how to make the web better that makes sense if somebody were thinking today to get into the the space of you know, sort of software and doing open source as a sort of a business model. I'm curious, do you, do you have feedback for people like that? It seems like a lot of people sort of dream about it, but then don't really know, okay, if I'm doing open source software and I'm giving it away, you know, how do, how do I make a company out of that? Yeah, I mean, there's many, you know, there's no one right way to build a business, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for us, we sort of chose a model that was based on, 
the things we like to do, you know, so we intentionally did not take on outside investment. Um, that might have been easier, it might have been harder, but we felt like we could stay true to our ideals if we had, you know, full control over our own destiny, mm-hmm. um, which certainly makes it harder to scale up a business up front. But it, and it also sort of forces you to learn how to make a business sustainable much faster. Um, you know, I don't necessarily know if I'd recommend that approach to everyone else, but it was the right path for us. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think many people have this belief that, hey, you know, if I write a really good open source project, people will just fund it forever. And <laughs> that's not really how it works, right? You need typically open source helps a business idea, right? So if you're going to create the next open source database, you're probably not going to charge license fees for that. Instead, you're probably going to find a product that you want to build that needs that next database to be competitive. Or, you know, if you're going to get into professional services, you know, the open source is going to support you and help make you more effective at offering those services. But it might actually be more effective to just leverage one of the other popular frameworks and provide services on top of that. Um, you know, if you're really good at marketing and sales. So, you know, really starting a business and building it on the top of open source, there's really many different factors and no one right formula, though there are certainly ways to make it work. Nice. So I think we've talked a bit about Dojo and Intern here. Um, I'm curious, though, one of the questions I ask is, um, what are your contributions to the JavaScript community? Um, And I, I usually like to kind of dig into some of the things that you're proud of having worked on. Um, you know, so that could be Dojo and it could be intern, but, you know, are, are there other things as well or are those primarily the areas that you like to focus on? I mean, we do a fair number of small things. Um, like one of the things we did over the past couple of years that sounds small, but is actually probably our most relied on dependency on, you know, NPM is a package called Remap Istanbul. And it's a pretty simple library. All it does is it basically says, if I want to measure code cover na- coverage analysis using Istanbul, but I want to do it for code that's been transpiled, meaning you know you wrote code in ES6 and you transpiled it to ES5 using Babel, or you use TypeScript, I want to be able to get that code coverage analysis against my original source code rather than the generated code. Mm-hmm. And so we and the version of Istanbul that almost everyone relies on didn't support that. So we wrote a little package to, that extended it in that way. Um, so sometimes it's just little problems that, you know, really make your workflow better that are nice. Uh, but I mean, clearly Dojo is the thing I've done that's had the most use. I mean, obviously Dojo 1 is not nearly as popular as it was, but there are still, you know, thousands of companies that leverage it in their stack and and we support them in their efforts. Um, and, you know, we're trying to, to really rethink things with Dojo 2. And, you know, Part of it is I really like to see things through from start to finish, and um, I'm not sure why that is, but you know, working on the same open source library for 13 or 14 years is probably not very common, right? Most people kind of get bored and, and switch on to things, but I feel a real obligation to our users to support them as long as they care to use our stuff. And so um, you know, really trying to continue to support those Dojo One users as long as they you know, want to use our software mm-hmm. while trying to come up with what's next for them um, is pretty much what I'm passionate about. And again, it's, you know, it goes back to why SitePen was started, which was that we wanted to make the web better. And, you know, that, that's a fairly general, um, you know, idealized goal. But really, we said this web thing is really promising. We see a lot of opportunity to create applications within a browser because of how they can be distributed. And anything we can do to make that process a bit easier and a bit more powerful, you know, we want to we want to help with that. And so really almost all of my work over the years has been focused on that and then building a company that can be sustaining, you know, that that is able to do that. Right. And Mm -hmm. and so that takes up a lot of my time as well, you know, just running the business and and, you know, giving feedback and, and things like that. Very cool. So where do you see the web going from here then? I mean, what? As you're writing a framework like Dojo 2, as you're, you know, building some of these tools, you have to have some idea of what you think you're building toward. Yeah. So, you know, it feels like the whole web kind of got a bit of a shock with, you know, ES6 in terms of how we rewrite frameworks. But it also, 
was it kind of coincided with the point in time where we could no longer have to worry about old versions of Internet Explorer. And so, you know, a lot of the things we do that are sort of reactive in their nature, whether it's watching properties and observing those, or whether it's, you know, doing a unidirectional data model to, into a virtual DOM, things like that, those would have never worked in IE 6 through 8, right? They just weren't possible. And we experimented with ideas like that before, um, and no one could quite get those right. And now what we see is these are ideas that are pretty much being used by every framework, right? Because they work now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and things continue to change over time. Um, I think that TypeScript has grown a lot in its popularity this year. We've been pretty avid users of it for over three years now. Um, and not because I, I think that you know JavaScript is bad, but just because I think that having interfaces is a major missing feature from the language. So you know, it's not types are great, but what types facilitate is the ability to express the intent of code through interfaces. So to be able to say, this object contains only these methods or properties, this is the surface of that API. So, um, you know, one of the big complaints I've had over the years is we've never, even with modularity, achieved, um, achieved true interoperability between libraries, right? So, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to use, you know, a DOM manipulation library and you were using jQuery and you wanted to swap it with something else, you couldn't really easily do that because the effort to actually support the full jQuery API was impossible to figure out. And probably the only project that's really been successful at doing that was Lodash and how it basically replicated the underscore API. Um, and the amount of time and effort JDD and his team had to put in to do that was just astonishing. And if they'd had an interface that described exactly how the API worked for underscore, that would have been much easier to achieve, mm -hmm. I think. And so to me, I think TypeScript is really interesting in that it's not trying to replace JavaScript. It's basically just saying, take JavaScript, add a couple things that make development a little more sane and a little more structured, and then, but you still get JavaScript at the end. So it's more of sort of a developer time productivity. So when you sort of take tools like TypeScript or transpilers like Babel, or even in the CSS space, things like post CSS, where instead of you know doing a different transpilation style language or syntax, you say, okay, give me the forward-looking CSS syntax and compile it back to the version of CSS that works today. If you start to take those patterns together, you know what you end up with is a, a really interesting approach to development, which is I can use the future now or what I expect the future to be now and still have it work without having to basically say, oh, I can't use that feature for five years until all the browsers support it. And that's a pretty powerful um, thing we've been able to do the past few years that we could not do before. Yeah. So, so I guess the answer to that is it, it makes it possible to get your hands on new things faster and actually leverage them. Whereas before we were always kind of waiting five to 10 years for a feature to be viable. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, just to throw this out there, I am actually talking to uh, JDD in a couple of weeks or well, in two days, but it'll be published in a couple of weeks. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that'll be great. But yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm also curious when I talk to people about their story, especially, especially somebody who's been in JavaScript as long as you have, um, what, what do you think are some of the overarching themes or some of the things that you've learned over the last, uh, you know, 13, 15 or more years uh, working in JavaScript that people who listen to the show can pick up on and say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I could learn from that or I could, you know, I could take that to heart and really, you know, grow. Yeah, um, there are a few. I mean, I think one of them is I didn't expect to be doing JavaScript for half my life, but now it's been 20 out of 42 years, which is pretty crazy. Um, wow. Yeah, I know, right? And so, you know, I think what you learn is that history constantly repeats itself, you know? So if you if you get really worked up thinking, hey, I have to use this framework because it's the only right way. In two years, you're going to be sorely disappointed because something else will come out that may be as good or better than it. Or, you know, that um, something may not be great now, but you might get used to it. And in a few years, something, you know, might come along that's better. But if you're so set in your ways, you might not be able to take advantage of that new thing because you won't be paying attention or, or open to those suggestions. Um, and I think those principles can be applied not just to JavaScript, but almost anything, but in particular JavaScript, because so much, you know, so much of my career I've spent defending the answer of, should I use framework A or framework B? 
And to me, that's not the right question, right? The right mm -hmm. question is, well, the answer I give is, well, okay, what are you trying to do? You know, what are you trying to build? What do you know? What are your strengths? Like, I could give you a, a very obscure, you know, functional approach that would not help you at all because your team has never done functional programming before. So even though it might be the best approach, you may fail miserably with it, right? And so really trying to sort of align all of your goals and your strengths and, and what you're trying to achieve with what's out there is the answer. And, you know, the, the easy question of, well, oh, use React because everyone uses it or, or use Dojo 1 because you need to support IE8 still, right? Those are just really easy answers. And, and generally, you know, there are no easy answers, but there's lots of choice, right? And you've got lots of great choices. So um, really, you know, just sort of seeing that happen over the years and progress and seeing all the great work that's gone into open source and, you know, all of these great things that we have that we like to complain about or that we like to, you know, act like they're these separate things that shouldn't work together. You know, we're all kind of moving towards the same goal. We just have different tastes or different, you know, opinions on things, but we all want to make the web better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what are you working on these days? I mean, have we kind of summed that up with our other questions or is there something else you want to bring up? I mean, we do some other fun things. Um, last year, we created a card game called Milestone Mayhem. And so it's actually a, a physical card game, you know, like 54 cards in a deck. And basically, it's about the ups and downs of software development projects. So <laughs> basically, the turns mimic sprint-based development. And the idea is basically you can overcome a little bit of mayhem, but not too much mayhem. So the mayhem cards are really fun. There are things like the scope creep or the grim repo, the guy who just pushes to production without testing. <laughs> or, um, I've worked with know, that guy. Yeah, exactly. So we created this card game basically as conference swag, and then we started putting it online and people seem to love it. And it's a very simple game, you know, like a six-year-old could play it. They won't understand the nuances of all the things that happen during sprints, but right. um, so that's just, that's at milestonemayhem.com. And then we're always trying to sort of make people think differently. So we've actually just started a blog series on SitePen, um, which is basically a 12 part series about how to choose a JavaScript framework. And it's got a music theme. Basically, if you know, if we chose our JavaScript framework, like we choose our music, we'd all be listening to Justin Bieber.js is kind of the opening line, which is <laughs> nice. pretty funny, right? But basically, yep. you know, um, the point of the series is not to say, this is the framework you should use. It's to sort of look at the process for how you choose a framework. So in this series, we basically are comparing six different frameworks, um, current versions of Angular, React plus Redux, Aurelia, Vue.js, Ember, and Dojo 2. And, you know, the goal is not to tell you which one wins. The goal is to tell you for all the different facets in which you might consider a framework, um, you know, what does each excel at? Where do they not have an opinion? Um, you know, if you're trying to do this, this framework might not be right for that problem without really telling you there's a clear winner because all of them serve great need and, and have their share of users. And so really, instead of just sort of trying to pick a winner, we've tried to really spend a lot of time. And I mean, I think by the end, it'll probably be a good three to four hour read of the whole series. So um, definitely different approach than just trying to crank something out. But, uh, you know, we, we really believe strongly in this trying to get people to think about how things work and why they do the things they do and, and, you know, really take a deep look at things before they just leap in. Very cool. If people want to read up on more of what you're working on or some of the things that SitePen is doing, is SitePen's blog the best place to go? Or are you on Twitter and GitHub and all those other fun places? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter and GitHub. I, I pretty much stopped my personal blog years ago because I ended up just writing most of my stuff for SitePen or Dojo's blogs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, on Twitter, I'm Dylan S. On GitHub, I think I'm the same. I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Well, the last section of this show is the picks. This episode is sponsored by Angular Dev Summit, coming September 11th through the 18th, 2017. Hi, it's Chuck from devchat.tv. I've reached out to some of my friends in the Angular community to put on a completely free, no travel conference for Ruby developers. We have speakers like Rob Wormald, Jeff Welpley, and others coming to speak about all kinds of topics in Angular. So if you're trying to learn Angular or you're trying to level up Angular, come check it out. The talks are happening throughout the day each day, and we'll have a chat available during each session. Attending the talks is free, but you need to register. Go to angulardevsummit.com. And uh, you haven't been on the show for a while, but I'm assuming you remember Pix. 
<laughs> yes, I do. The funny thing is I just gave you my picks <laughs> as the other things I was working on. <laughs> oh, nice. Good for you. Some people are afraid to promote what they're working on. And I, I always feel a little bit bad about that because, I mean, the reason we're having you on is because you're doing awesome stuff. So, Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think there's there's so many cool things out there. It, it, it's hard to just pick a few. Um, you know, I think another thing that, um, is kind of cool in the space that wasn't really that, you know, so, all right, this is a pretty funny story. So back in 2000, when I was living in Los Angeles, I tried to start a JavaScript user group and people heard me tell this story cause it's so funny, but basically in two years, two people were applied. One person was looking for the Java user group. So I sent them on their way. And the second person and I got together a couple of times and we kind of said, well, this is kind of lame and we stopped meeting. And now, you know, in every city, there's dozens of, JavaScript centric meetup groups. Um, I guess the point was, you know, years ago, there was like the Ajax experience and there were a few big JavaScript conferences, but now pretty much every city in the US and even worldwide has a decent sized local JavaScript conference, you know, whether it's London or Seattle or, you know, even like Omaha, Nebraska or wherever, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's pretty much a JavaScript conference for you. So, I just really encourage people to get to at least one or two events like that a year, you know, whether it's meetup groups or a local conference or whatever, um, and just meet more people like them that, you know, write JavaScript code and try to absorb as much as they can. And, and so, um, you know, a few of the conferences were involved with this year, whether it's some people on our team are helping organize them or that we're, you know, attending or giving our card game away at our, in London, there's half stack and full stack. Um, in Nebraska, there's the NEJS conf, which is in its third year. Its first year, it was in a zoo. This year, I think it's in a, a Masonic uh, temple, which is kind of cool. Um, let's see. Uh, there's Seattle JS. We're going to attend that as well. Um, I help organize the Phoenix TypeScript meetup as well as uh, London Halfstack. And, um, you know, I, I just think that's a great way to get out and meet people mm -hmm. is, is either meetups or conferences. So it's probably what I would plug as my picks. Awesome. Yeah, that's a lot of what I tell people to do. Um, I've been working on a course and quit coaching people on just finding their first or their second because sometimes they get into their first dev job, they work there for a year or so, and then they feel like they're stuck. And so I help them move up or some people feel like they're stuck after they get out of the boot camp. And yeah, I tell them to go out to the meetup groups and the conferences because that's where you're going to meet the people who are really passionate about what they're doing. And the fact that you're there speaks volumes to your passion and commitment to what you're doing. So um, anyway, I, I absolutely. I and yeah, and also welcome. don't be afraid to talk to the speakers and, you know, get to know people. Don't feel like you should, um, you know, be shy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I know so many of the speakers that that's why they're there. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So, you know, yeah. if I, if I didn't need to be there, you know, I, it would be because I don't like talking to people, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. So, well, and they go because they like having the, you know, they like sharing what they know and then having that social, hey, let's talk about code and, and all the cool stuff that we get to do. Absolutely. I mean, most good ideas at conferences happen in the hallway track or, you know, one on one, not during the main yep. sessions themselves. Yep. Or while Absolutely. you're chatting after dinner or yep. during dinner. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks myself. It's funny because somebody just asked me what my favorite productivity tools are. And so I'm going to pick some of those, um, mainly because I've been focused a lot more on sort of the production end of podcasts and not so much on the programming end of podcasting, um, which is kind of sad because I really like to get back to the programming as much. But anyway, um, so the tools that I sent them now, this is somebody who actually has a product out there. It's called Focuster, and it is a terrific tool. Um, basically, you put in your tasks for the day and then it schedules them into your calendar for you and helps you, you know figure out what you're going to get done for the day and that kind of thing. And so it's a terrific tool. Um, if you're on the Mac, I really like BusyCal. So I'm going to pick that as well. Um, I'm a big user of BusyCal as well. I yeah, love it. I switched to Windows um, a few months ago just because I could get a machine that could run a lot more stuff. And mm -hmm. I really miss it. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I also use Asana for a lot of stuff mm -hmm. with, with the podcast production. And Asana actually has for lack of a better way of putting it, essentially Trello boards. So they're the workflow yeah. boards um, in it. And so a lot of the stuff we do winds up in there. So the podcast production, all of that's in, in a board like that. And so I put Trello down as well, just because I, I like the way that you can build workflows in that. 
Um, but yeah, I'm using Asana because then I don't have to add teams to two different apps. Yeah, I love Asana. Um, you know that the founders of it actually were at Facebook before they started Asana, um, Justin and Dustin. And um, years ago, when Facebook was relatively small, our SitePen team did a two-day JavaScript training workshop for all Facebook engineers. So basically everyone except for Zuckerberg, like 115 of them, uh, attended this two-day workshop where we basically taught them how we wrote JavaScript. And um, Dustin and Justin were there, and that's when I met them. And they're uh, really nice guys and have been you know, really working to sort of um, try to take the lessons they learned at, at mm -hmm. sort of prioritizing development and just project management and, you know, bring that to sort of the masses, which is, which is what Asana is. And, um, you know, and Trello is also a great tool, but I, I, you know, have a special place in my heart for Asana just cause I, you know, knew those guys when they were a two person startup and trying to make it. So right. they do really good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for coming, Dylan. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to just talk and kind of get these perspectives. I mean, you know, you're talking about the early 2000s. That's when I was doing Ruby. And so JavaScript was kind of the, the part of the job that I had to do until, you know, I kind of came around. But uh, yeah, it's, it's so interesting just to see, oh, well, back then we were dealing with this. And so this is the way we solve those problems. And just to hear that about Dojo and, and how that came about is really awesome. So thanks for sharing. Of course. Thanks for having me. We will wrap this one up and we will catch everybody with another story next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.